And Shabbat Shalom and greetings to the 12 tribes scattered abroad. We are in part four of the Sukkot teaching, Sukkot at Sukkot. Shall I do it? I shall do it. Can you imagine how my email has been blowing up? Matthew, are you, do you stand with Israel? What do you think about what's going on over in Israel? Matthew, what's going on in Israel? Do you stand with Israel? We need to know. Do you stand? Okay, so before I get in my teachings, pay attention. I'll make a very brief statement on, on that subject so you don't have to keep emailing me. You don't have to keep emailing. What's going on in Israel? What's going on over there? This is what's going on over there, according to moi. All right, so you can take it or you can leave it. Take it? I'm not sure if you will. The real Israel from the Bible was a man called Yaakov. That's the first point. Yaakov, Israel, he had 12 sons. Thus, Israel is all 12 tribes, not a Jewish state. Oh, the kingdom of Judah in Judea of the Bible migrated to the kingdom of Judah in Negro land in West Africa after 70 of the common era until the sons of Japheth, employed the Slavic nations to ply their trade of slaving, slaving. Many of today's Palestinians are the Fehalim, the original, original Jewish inhabitants of the land who converted to Islam to avoid the jizya tax. You ask me what I think of what's going on, I'm telling you. The problems that started this weekend, it is the season of what? Sukkot. What happened? Over 800 Ashkenazi settlers entered the al Aska Mosque at the beginning of Sukkot, and that kicked off the tensions. All war is pushed by thieving Bolshevik commie bankers. My opinion, I think it's pretty, pretty apparent. The US funded Iran to the tune of $6 billion. Ukraine sold Hamas weapons according to Hamas. So the U.S. is complicit in the action. The triad, Ukraine, the commies at NATO, and Iran's goal is to overextend our nation with defense spending and defeating us with debt and collapse our economy within six months. That's what I think of what's going on. And now I'll get to the teaching. So take it or leave it. You heard it here. You might want to rewind that. There's so much propaganda. I forgot I just cut right through it. And get to the meat of the issue. So this teaching actually coincides with that subject matter very well because I'm going to be talking about the monarchy and the battle for Jerusalem. The monarchy and the battle for Jerusalem, going back to the Crusades, the Temple Mount, where the al Aska Mosque, of course, sits. And I'm going to be talking about the Temple Mount. We left off yesterday about the heraldry. And I kind of touched a little bit about the coat of arms and the chain that holds the unicorn on Prince Charles's coat of arms to its base. And it's directly above the red dragon. And the unicorn's two hind feet are touching the base in Prince Charles' heraldry. And Cohen goes into this in great detail in his book. 
But in his later coat of arms, Prince Charles, the chain is detached from the base and it no longer restrains the unicorn. And its right rear hoof is elevated from the base. Also, the red dragon is nowhere touching the base is associated rim, which is quite interesting when you think about being restrained and the restrainer and the dragon of revelation. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 1, it is written, Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Savior, Yahushua HaMashiach, and by our gathering together unto him, that ye not soon be shaken in mind or be troubled, neither by Ruach, nor by word, nor by letter, as from us, as that the day of Mashiach is at hand. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first. We're definitely in those days. And the man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called Elohim or that is worship. So that he, as Elohim, sitteth in the temple of Elohim, showing himself that he is Elohim. Like I said, the events in the Jewish state were kicked off by Ashkenazi settlers going into the Alaska mosque with the state supporting them. And that kicked off the tensions. So this whole fight for Jerusalem and the real estate has been going on for a long time. And it is traced back to the three vertices, the city of London, the Vatican, and of course the banking, which now politically originates in the third vertice of Washington, D.C. But let's talk about the British monarchy, shall we? and the monarchy's historical connection to the crusader kings of Jerusalem and the crusades. It's not improbable whatsoever that King Charles would want to sit on the throne in Jerusalem. When you understand the history for the fight for the throne of Jerusalem, when you understand the British's involvement in Palestine in the end of the 19th and early 20th century, you will clearly see that they have their eyes upon the throne of Jerusalem and have since the days of the Crusades. Some things never change. It's just masked in modern politics and warfare. The Angevin dynasty, I nearly said it the American way, dynasty. The Angevin dynasty, which included King Richard the Lionheart and King Henry II, they were, of course, crusaders. Richard the Lionheart, King Henry II, crusaders. Especially Richard the Lionheart in the Third Crusade. He led in the capture of Acre and the Battle of Ursuf during the Third Crusade. I'm going to have a hard time concentrating. I think. Let's see what happened, Tamara? Did your did your children's group close? Yeah. Oh. Can you help me out? I can help you out. Splendid. How about all the children come on out on the playground with me? Okay. So we're talking about King Henry II, we're talking about especially Richard the Lionheart, we're talking about the Crusaders and the fight for Jerusalem. I love the children, but I'm not that smart. I can't get through what I need to get through because I just can't focus. I'm just not that clever. So please forgive me, mothers and fathers. Don't take it personally. It's not your children. It's my lack of attention. 
Eleanor of Aquitaine, Henry II's wife and Richard's mother, was previously married to King Louis VII of France, who participated in the Second Crusade. See a connection here? All of the monarchs of Europe and this eventual European Union and NATO and what's happening, happening right now, it's all just a political arm of what was already established. Because you're not going to buy King Louis' descendants going over there, but you'll go for NATO, you'll go for some European Union, okay? So they just change the shade, but ultimately it's still the same color. Because it's about ancestral claims. Why do you think the Ashkenazi settlers went into the Alaska mosque during Sukkot? It's alleged ancestral claims. It's kicking off right now. But what do we really stand with? We stand with this, what the scripture says and how the scripture defines Israel, how the, dis, the scripture defines Jews, how the scripture defines the promised land, not politics, not the church, and not being politically correct. It's about ancestral claims. European monarchs, including English ones, claim descent from biblical or historical figures linked to the Holy Land, often for political legitimacy. And that's what we're seeing right now. They want political legitimacy, whether it's Hamas, whether it's the Zionist state, whether it's NATO, whether it's Ukraine, what are they looking for? They're looking for political legitimacy. Crusader states like the Kingdom of Jerusalem were established in the Levant during the First Crusade. European nobility, including English knights and nobles, contributed to their governance. The Crusades fostered interactions and alliances between European royalty and the Crusader states. English knights ventured off into the Holy Land. The British monarchy's involvement in the Crusades is part of the broader European context of medieval nobility and their complex relationships. And it could easily, in my opinion, fulfill this text. Second Thessalonians 2, 5. Remember ye not that when I was yet with you, I told you these things. And now ye know that what restraineth that he might be revealed in his time. The Malcha has been dead for a year. The 70 year reign of the king, Malcha, queen, has ended. What restraineth has been taken out of the way. And now longer is the coat of arms restrained and shackled because he now has a new coat of arms as a melech. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth will let it until, until he be taken out of the way. Second Thessalonians 2 and verse 8. And then, when, then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Savior shall consume with the ruach of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Even him whose coming is after the working of S.A. Tan with all power and signs and lying wonders and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish because they receive not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. And for this cause, Yahweh shall send them strong propaganda, strong delusion, that they should believe the lies being disseminated on all of your screens all over the place, that they all might be damned who believe not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. How do you stand? Do you stand with Israel, Matthew? How do you stand? I just told you. 
because it is absolutely a clown show. Let's cut really succinctly to what's going on here. I hope you see where I'm coming from. The Greek word in this text, kachikeo, literally means to hold down. So in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 6, now as King Charles, it is loosed. It is no longer restrained. Do you see that? He was restrained ever since birth. But since the, the death of the Malka, the queen, he has been loosed, no longer restrained. The unicorn has reared its back. It has raised its hoof and the eye appears to be winking. I think Proverbs is pretty clear about that. You see, Jerusalem was entrusted to the kings of Jerusalem. The Vatican thirsts to sit upon the throne of Jerusalem. Could we agree to that? For sure and for certain. The synagogue of Satan, case in point, this very Sukkot, thirsts to sit upon the throne of Jerusalem. The monarchy thirsts to sit upon the throne for Jerusalem. That brings you to Daniel chapter 9, the 70 weeks prophecy. That brings you to Daniel chapter 11, the abomination of desolation. That brings you to the prince of the covenant who is now broken. Why? He became king of the covenant. The prince of the covenant is now broken. Why? Because he became king of the covenant. Is it possible? Is it probable? Is it peculiar? It's certainly the latter, peculiar. Probable? Possible? I don't know. But peculiar? Definitely worth investigating. Beth, definitely worth putting that one back there and seeing what happens, wouldn't you say? Daniel chapter 11, Daniel, verse 21. And in his territory, funny, territory? territorial jurisdiction, the three vertices, City of London, Vatican City, Washington, D.C., and in his territory, got to rope you into that territorial jurisdiction, shall stand up a vile person to whom they shall not give the honor of the kingdom, but he shall come in peaceably and obtain the kingdom by flatteries. And with the arms of a flood, shall they be overflown from before him. Quite a lot of migrant flooding going on right now that is overflowing the nations, that is deliberately done to destabilize the economy of nations, whether it be Europe, whether it be the United States. There is definitely the arms of a flood is overthrowing the nations, would you agree? And shall be broken also the prince of the covenant. And after the league, hmm, what happened after the league of nations? The UN was birthed out of the league of nations. Interesting. So they believe that they're the ones that established biblical Israel. Therefore, do they not think they have the right to put the king on the throne of the nation that they established? But we know that that's not biblical Israel, right? And with him shall work deceitfully, for he shall come up and shall become strong with a small people. Could that mean he will come up from a small people? like the island merchants of Tarshish, just a group of tin merchants over there in the British Isles. In Psalm 41, in the ninth verse, it is written, Yea, mine own familiar friend in whom I trusted, which did eat of my bread, hath lifted up his heel against me. The unicorn has lifted up its heel because the prince is no longer the prince of the covenant. He is now unshackled, no longer restrained. The unicorn having lifted up his heel, he is now king of the covenant. If there was anyone besides bumbling Biden who could put their foot in their mouth, it's definitely Charles. 
Proverbs 6, 13, it is written, he winketh with his eyes, he speaketh with his feet, and he teacheth with his fingers. If there was anyone that speaketh with his feet, aside from bumbling Biden, it certainly would be Charlie. Genesis chapter 49, verse 17, it is written, Dan shall be a serpent by the way, an adder in the path, that biteth the horse's heels, so that his rider shall fall backwards. Holy men fall forward and little devils fall backwards. Dan, where we get the Danites. English, no, Danites. But I thought we were talking about King Charles. He's English, isn't he? Very interesting with Dan and the Danites. Danish, King Charles's paternal grandmother was Queen Ingrid of Denmark and was a Danish princess by birth before before coming the Queen's Consort of Denmark. There's your Dan connection to Genesis 49, verse 17, and Prince Charles. How is this going to play out? One doesn't know. But will it roll right into the midst of Jacob's trouble when you just thought it couldn't possibly get any worse? Will the prophecy of Daniel's midst of the week, starting with the daily sacrifice, being called back? Because this already was taken away, was it not? When was the daily sacrifice taken away? Huh? So how can that be so, that it be taken away? It's already been taken away. I think the whole purpose of the Ashkenazi storming the Alaska Mosque on Sukkot is to call back the sacrifices. Wouldn't you agree? Well, let's look at the text because this is where the Messianic movement and the Zionist Christians have become thoroughly, thoroughly deceived. Do you stand with Israel? Daniel chapter 8, verse 9. Let's turn there. Get your pencils out so you can adjust the translation if you see that it is fitting. Daniel chapter 8, verse 9. And out of one of them came forth a little horn, which waxed exceedingly great towards the south, towards the east, and towards the pleasant land. And it waxed great even to the host of heaven. And it cast down some of the host of the stars to the ground and stamped upon them. Yea, he magnified himself even to the prince of the host. And the daily sacrifice, King Jimmy, was taken away and the place of his sanctuary was cast down. Hmm. The place of Yahuwah's sanctuary, we know as believers, is Yahusha. The book of Hebrews is very explicit on that. That's the whole point of my post-millennial hypothesis. Now, it's interesting. If you look at verse 11, Daniel chapter 8, verse 11, in all known English translations, has translated the Hebrew word room, Strong's number 7311, as taken away. This word's meaning comes from the context of rising or raising. And it is more often than not being translated to exalt or exalting. Strong's number 7311, room. The word room has been used 209 times in the Tanakh. The overwhelming support for this interpretation of this word shows that it means to rise or to exalt. It's been several times translated as take up or take from, but in context has always been in a sense of raising, not taking away or casting away. 
I'll repeat that because this is where the King Jimmy got the translation. Several times it has been translated take up or take from. But they miss the context. It's been translated that way, but always in the context has been in a sense of raising, not taking away or casting away. Daniel uses the Hebrew word room 13 times in his book. Of these 13 uses, all have a context of something being raised or lifted up or exalted or being made high. What's weird is in Daniel chapter 11, in some manuscripts, the word room is used twice consecutively. So this literal translation of the text then would read, he was magnified before the prince of the host and the daily sacrifice was exalted. The exalted cornerstone of the holy place, the Messiah, was cast down. So the exalting this is the kicker. The exalting of a daily sacrifice of bulls or goats or of any blood other than Yahusha is the abomination, is what I'm teaching. That is in line with the book of Hebrews, and it is not in line with rabbinical Judaism. And it is not in line with the Talmud. And it is not in line with the Mishnah. And it is not in line with NATO. And it is not in line with the United States foreign policy when it stands with Israel. So how do I stand? I stand on the word. The exalting of a daily sacrifice of bulls or goats or any other blood other than Yahushua's is the abomination. Do not give heed to endless genealogies. Don't care what your blood is. Don't care about your DNA. The only blood that matters is the blood of the Lamb that was slain before the foundations of the world. This is clear. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 23, through Hebrews chapter 10, verse 18. This is salvific. I don't often say that. This is a salvation issue. OK, it's a salvation issue. There's some things that I'm absolutely will not budge on. And this is a salvation issue. Any blood but the blood of Yahushua's is an abomination of desolation. Any sacrifice but the sacrifice of Yahushua that is exalted is an abomination of desolation. If they bring back a sacrificial system, that is an affront to the blood of the Lamb. It is salvific. So this place is the prophecy of Daniel's midst of the week, starting when? When the daily sacrifice is taken away? No. When the daily sacrifice is called back. And that's exactly what they're trying to do by storming the Alaska Mosque on Sukkot. Ra, 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 ra. Do you stand with Israel? No. I stand with Jacob, Yaakov, Israel. All 12 tribes scattered abroad that are being brought back from the nations under the banner of Yahushua Hamashiach. Let's look at Daniel chapter 12, verse 11. And from the time that the daily sacrifice shall be taken away and the abomination that maketh desolate set up, there shall be a thousand two hundred and ninety days or three and a half years. So the Hebrew word here for taken away is a different Hebrew word. It's Strong's number 5493, Kur. This word has a meaning of turning of turning and this translation of taken away appears to be in direct contrast to daniel chapter 8 verse 11. make the comparison between daniel 12 11 strong's number 54 93 and daniel chapter 8 verse 11 and um the strong's number i gave you for that note takers 
is Strong's number 7311. Make the comparison. Spend a few minutes looking and meditating on that and see if you draw the same conclusion. Because this translation of taken away, it appears to be in direct contrast to Daniel chapter 811. This can only be reconciled by determining what is being turned from. And it's apparent when you read the context that they are turning from one thing to something that is an abomination. Turning from one thing to something that is an abomination. Knowing that any animal or daily sacrifice is insufficient is key. It's not the blood of bulls and goats. The translation of the word kur means being called back. What this means, brethren, is the daily sacrifice would be called back to prominence, which would be turning from the true Malkitetic sacrifice of Yahusha and turning to the unacceptable Levitical sacrifice of the blood of bulls and goats that the prophecy of Daniel's midst of the week actually starts with the daily sacrifice being called back up in Jerusalem, not being taken away as Messianics teach and Christian Zionists teach. It's totally opposite. And you can see why many will be deceived. Many will be deceived. Oh, rah, rah, rah. Uh, uh, uh. I mean, really? All oh, the blood of fool is going to end Israel. It bring it to Lee. I mean, sorry, but it's just like, oh, good night. Hey, everybody, let's dress up as Jews and go up to the Temple Mount. Right? I mean, good night. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to be popular. I'm not popular anyway. Who cares? I, I never have been one to win a popularity contest, let me tell you. Even back in school. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> The elevation of the blood of bulls and goats is the end time casting down of the one true sacrifice, Yahusha. 666. We just had a good conversation, I told you. He was giving me material while we were kicking back on the beach. And he, um, Brother Jeff was sharing with me. Going back to 666 and King Solomon... And the breakdown really is King Solomon was everything, all the promises that he could have been. The ultimate, right, example of what he could have been. But then he became the very opposite. And it was attributed to three things. What was it? Money, gold, multiplication of gold multiplication of a war chest horses and multiplication of whoredoms 666 mystery babylon what is she doing multiplying her riches gold she's a whore multiplying women and she is building her war chest everything that she could be she is not that's really what it is and that's the calling for us to be everything that we are called and have been created to be, not the opposite. And watch those three areas. Don't argue. Don't build a war chest of arguments and pride. Don't be covetousness about building wealth and wealth and wealth. There's nothing wrong with wealth. There's nothing wrong with treasure. But the love of treasure is the root of all evil. And it's a good thing for a man to find a good wife. Right? Hallelujah. 
And the conclusion of the matter, fear Yahuwah and keep his mitzvah. So when you break down 666 like that, and then you can look at Prince Charles. And you can go Prince Charles, full name and titles into the Hebrew Gematria equivalents. Yes, you find a pattern of 666. But he's no longer a prince. Yes, but he's a king. And has he done all of those things that we just discussed? Building a war chest? Oh, yeah. He's not waking more. Oh, you, he's making war on the polluters of the environment. That's his vehicle for making war. If you want to look at his intimate life, don't go much further than his brother. Right? Apple doesn't fall too far from the tree. Jimmy Savile was very connected with the royal family. Apple doesn't fall too far from the tree. Good buddies there. I think that covers the whoredom. You've got the war chest. So then what's the other one? Treasures? Indebted since King Edward I to who? The Bolshevik bankers. Yes, definitely 666 there whether it's prince or whether it's king, all the bad things listed for a king that the Torah says not to do. So by assigning the numerical values to each letter in Prince Charles's name and titles, you can combine them and come up with that number. Of course, Hebrew Jamacha is highly speculative, just like Paleo-Hebrew, highly speculative. But anyway, it's quite interesting to see the symbolic connections then between his title and the Welsh flag, which features none other than what? A red dragon. And Revelation 12 verse 3 in the Bible describes a vision of a great red dragon with seven heads and ten horns. And there appeared another wonder in the Shamayim, and behold, a great red dragon having seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns upon his head. And this red dragon, of course, symbolizes Satan. And the ten horns, well, could it have something to do with NATO, the European Union, the nations in a ten-nation alliance in the future? It's probable, it's possible, it definitely piques my interest. But what about the crowns? How many crowns? Seven crowns. Well, history is quite clear on that. Crown number one was the crown of the papacy. The first crown represents the papacy or the Roman Catholic Church, which has historically been associated with various crowns and tiaras as a symbol and symbols of its authority. Jews had interaction with the Vatican through various historical periods. Popes and church authorities, of course, employed Jewish financiers for loans and for financial services, as we've been going in and explaining. Jewish communities in Italy, particularly in Rome, had both economic and legal interactions with the Vatican. The second crown is the crown of the Holy Roman Empire. It represents the Holy Roman Empire, which was a complex political entity in medieval Europe that had close ties to the Catholic Church. Throughout the history of the Holy Roman Empire, again, the Ashkenazi played roles in financial transactions and commerce within all of its territories. Ashkenazi moneylenders often operated in the territories of the Holy Roman Empire, providing loans to individuals, to monarchs, nobles, and rulers. The third crown, the crown of Germany. Uh-oh, he's going to start talking about Germany. It could be dangerous. The third crown represents the nation of Germany, 
which has historical connections to both the Holy Roman Empire, the papacy, and moneylenders. Germany had one of the oldest and largest Ashkenazi communities in Europe. Moneylenders were active in medieval Germany, providing financial services to both Christians and Jews. Jews played roles in local commerce and laws in various German cities. Of course, we shouldn't make any connections whatsoever to Germany's debt and inflationary crisis that led to the rise of the National Socialist Party. We shouldn't even talk about that. But I just did. The fourth crown is the crown of France. The fourth crown symbolizes France, another significant European nation with historical ties to the Catholic Church and the Holy Roman Empire. France has had significant interaction with money lenders throughout medieval times. Money lenders were prominent in providing loans to French nobility and to the commoners. Money lenders were involved in legal matters in France, including serving as notaries and participating in the legal merchant trafficking and trading system. You can see how it's all interconnected down through the ages. Then you look at the expulsions and you wonder why. Then you look at the conflicts and the wars and you wonder why. The fifth crown is the crown of Spain. The fifth crown being Spain, which played a prominent role in the history of Catholicism and the spread of Christianity, particular, particularly during the age of exploration. Over here to the New World. Spain had a rich Jewish heritage, particularly during the Middle Ages. Jewish financiers were also removed from the country for the same reason that Edward I did. Jewish money lenders overplayed their hand in the financial systems of medieval Spain. And what we're seeing right now is there is going to be an overplaying of the hand. And the beast is going to rise up and devour the whore which is upon her back. You overplayed your hand. It's happened in the past. Not once, not twice, but thrice. Nothing new. That's why history in the Bible is so, so enriching. The sixth crown, are we on number six? Is the crown of Portugal. Another European nation with, again, strong Catholic heritage and a history of exploration, slaving, and colonization. They went into Negro land and the kingdom of Judah. Okay? Portugal also had an historical Jewish presence. Jewish communities in Portugal were involved in commerce and finance and entered shipbuilding because they were maritime Ashkenazi enslaving every walk of life into contracts and debts. And they went up into the Slavic nations and plied their trade using their ships. These were Babylonian legal experts that contributed to Portuguese law and governance. And then finally, we get the seventh crown, England. England, which will become a future extension of the Holy Roman Empire under the leader of the Antichrist. Is it possible? Is it probable? It certainly piques my interest. In medieval England, again, the synagogue of Satan played significant roles as moneylenders. They provided loans, excuse me, to English monarchs and nobility, and the monarchy is still very much indebted to them today through the City of London and the Bank of England, one of the three vertices of the all-seeing eye pyramid. So really, when you look at the heraldry, it clearly connects Prince Charles to the Red Dragon on the Prince's Wales title and the Welsh flag's dragon symbol. And I think it's very apparent 
when you look at the geopolitics of the world today, politics of the world today, the links between Prince Charles, who's now a king, and S.A. Tan are certainly represented by the heraldry and by the red dragon, the unicorn, and the lion with its young lions, all of those countries in the Commonwealth. So the 10 horns of the dragon, they certainly could signify a future 10 nation alliance or a confederation under King Charles's leadership and the rise of some kind of antichrist figure. So ultimately it's a race for Jerusalem. It's a race to liberty, opening the debtor's prison and unbinding us all contractually from the commercial slave system learning how we must go to acceptance in all areas of our life. The acceptable year of Yahuwah. Yahuwah will appoint for us beauty, joy, praise, planted in Jerusalem and liberty in the millennial rule. It's definitely a battle for Jerusalem. It's definitely a battle for the blood of Yahusha. It's definitely a battle for millennium rule. And you can see it playing out right before you right now we've covered a lot in four teachings but i hope that you can see that this has been going forward for a long long time and in summary i believe that you will see in your lifetime the beast devour the whore the beast is the governance of the Vatican, the underlying governance that has been there since Edward I. And the whore being the financial system that have overplayed their hand. And the beast will devour it. I think you're going to see the biggest financial collapse, bigger than 1929, and a total resetting. And there is either going to be the kingdom of priests and the elite and then a slave society because the whole of the middle class is going to be absolutely wiped out. That's the plan. Move them into small cities and then plunder. But Yahweh has another plan. Hallelujah. And that's to bring his people into one house. The two shall become one in the hand of Messiah. The two-step prophecy coming into one. And I see that, and we're seeing that in our days. Torah to the tribes, all 12 tribes scattered abroad. The ingathering in this time as we get ready for Jacob's trouble and to go into the millennial reign. There is much hope for us ahead. But we must seriously think and meditate on the things that have been discussed over this Sukkot about preparing and restructuring ourselves, our families and a way forward into the future. Because I believe that Yahweh wants us to rule and reign from Jerusalem. And that Jerusalem is where his people is. Does it mean it will be this bloody city? Because just like 666 and King Solomon, and we were discussing this. Jerusalem, everything that it could be, it has become the very opposite, become that bloodied city. So, yes, that is something to keep in mind. I don't think that we should be rushing off to the Middle East when Yahweh is gathering his people in the nation in which they're housed. He's doing a great work wherever you are. He wants us to gather together at the Sabbaths, at the feasts, and prepare for the leading of the Ruach HaKadosh, not the leading of men. Remember, if you read the book of Yasher in the 70-odd chapters, maybe it's the 72nd, it tells you that the tribe of Ephraim, they got the prophecies and the timing wrong, and they left Egypt 40 years early, and they got massacred in the desert. There's going to be a whole bunch of Christian Zionists and Messianics that are going to fly over to the Zionist state. Ra, 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 ra. Oh, my goodness. They're doing Sukkot up on the Temple Mount and they've reinstituted the sacrificial system. Let's get our Torah. Let's get our seat seats. Let's get our long knee dragon beards and let's get over there. Okay. And that's what they're going to do. And that, I tell you what, that's Ephraim mixing up the prophecies. 
because 1948 was not the establishment of biblical Israel. 1948 was the establishment of what we now have seen here, and it is the new world order. Be careful, be watchful, be wise as serpents, be harmless as doves. We come in honor, we stay in honor, and we leave in honor, and let's not argue. Let's not argue at all. Let's be people of shalom. Shalom, shalom. Shalom, shalom. Baruch Hashem. Yahuwah. Amen. Amen. Questions, comments, interactions?